Uh, please welcome our special guest, Cindy Blackstock. Well, that is a heck of a picture. Yeah, it really is, you know, and that story is one I hear today. You know, it's um, one that would have been heard during the residential schools in many ways. One we heard during the 60s group, but one we're hearing today in numbers that outstrip both of those experiences. There's more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children in child welfare care today than at the height of residential schools. Let's talk, let's dive a little deeper. What, give us the real numbers behind that. Like in comparison to um, the rest of the population, how overrepresented are Indigenous children right now in social services and child services? The, the data we have that's the best is for First Nations children because it's the largest group. We know that First Nations children are 12 times more likely to be in foster care than other kids. And you saw on the form, the court form there, that he was a neglected child. That's exactly the same reason why First Nations children were moved today. Uh, poverty, poor housing, and uh, substance re abuse related to the trauma of those missions that we we're hearing about. So things are very much the same. And one of the things that uh, during the, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, we took Canada to court uh, because they provide far less funding for child welfare services on reserves than other Canadians receive by an order of about 22 to 30 percent less, which means those families are less able to keep their kids and their families. When we filed that case in 2007, the federal government fought it for nine years, as you know, Jesse. And when we were at trial finally in 2013, after they had depleted all the legal technicalities, one of the documents that took my breath away counted up the number of First Nations children who are in foster care between 1989 and 2012 on reserve and in the Yukon. So this ex excludes kids off reserve. And if you added up all the sleeps those little kids had spent on care, it was over 66 million nights or 187,000 years of childhood. And as we sit here, that number grows by 10,000 sleeps every night. I've seen this movie 20, this is probably the 20th time I've seen the movie. I find things in it all the time. One of the things I noticed was a moment the boom was in that I know Gil would hate now. But um, one of the things that, that you know, uh, folks have been, there's a couple of things. The mission schools yeah. are residential schools, just so we're clear. That's just a different name for them. Uh, mission schools was very much the language they used in Australia. Yeah. That's what they were called in Australia. But it's all uh, industrial schools is another name that would be used. They're all the same. Uh, thing. 1951 is when Gill was born, so just we're also clear on history. That's just shy of a decade before Indigenous people had the vote right. in Canada. So uh, another thing to keep rem remember is at that time, we didn't have a say in, in the policy that governed us. So we were still, and 1951 would have been just the time when the potlatch ban would have been lifted in Canada, that was the year it came to an end. So that, that law, uh, if you don't know, also outlawed our languages, our ceremonies, our stories. It allowed the stealing of our cultural artifacts with, well, which in combination with the residential schools was really the destruction of our culture and the, the loss of our language. One of the things Gil touches on, and I'd love to explore with you, because they talk about how his mother went to residential school and then didn't know how to parent. And, you know, this is true of so many First Nations family. I see it in my family because, of course, there's my elders who went to residential school, and you can see the break in the parenting happen, and it creates cycles that are then really difficult to get out of. So, can you can we explore just how this that is still a systemic issue, that intergenerational trauma, and how that then produces the neglect or those sources that they then claim for neglect to take the kids and put them into care. You know, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission heard from thousands of survivors. And actually, if you have a chance, go and read uh, Marie Wilson's affidavit in support of the case on FN Witness. It's filed in December 2016. And what she says is that many of those survivors told those very painful stories, not only about what happened to them as children, but how their own relationship to parent was broken. For one reason, Jesse, 
And that was they didn't want it to happen to their grandkids. And I remember one elder who was in residential school who had been badly physically abused, badly sexually abused, uh, who wasn't given any more than a grade three education because the assumption was that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children would never become anything. And, and of course, you rightly point out we weren't people until 1960, so we couldn't even go to university, right? Um, so all of those things mapped up. But he said, the most horrible thing that happened to me were the things I didn't get. I never was hugged. No one ever comforted me when I cried. No one ever told me that I was a good boy. No one ever celebrated my birthday. And one of the most poignant things I remember seeing in Alberta when I was there for listening to the survivors during the TRC ceremony is they actually had a birthday ceremony, birthday party for all of the children in residential schools who never had a birthday party during the time they were there. So you can imagine as a parent, and I remember seeing this, I was a frontline child protection worker for 13 years, and the hardest things for the parent was just to love their kid, to open themselves up, to love them, to sit on the floor and know how to play with them because that was never given to them. One of the other things he mentions is she was arrested. That's one of the things we find out. She was arrested for being drunk. And it's key to note, again, this is a legal thing, when that was, they sent you to jail. If you were found uh, drunk off reservation, uh, this 1951 would have meant that the pass system in uh, Alberta would have still been active. Yeah. So you would have had to get permission to leave your community from the Indian agent. And if you'll know, there's a great documentary about this by a guy named Alex Williams, which explores, and they tried to obscure this, by the way. They burnt the records of the past system to try to make sure that no one would ever uh, discover it, but he dug up examples. Um, so again, there was, she was put into jail for two months, which meant that she couldn't attend any of the uh, hearings to for her child um, because of a, a oppressive, racial law on the books for Canada. And this is, we still struggle with this, the difference of how we are treated under the law versus everyone else. And this is a systemic issue that leads to these sorts of results. Yeah, like I mean, even if we take this underfunding of services, right? Which is not just in child welfare, it's in education, it's in healthcare, it's in basics like water, it's in sewer. Um, and then you're judged by the same standard everybody else is. And somehow you've experienced all this multi-generational trauma, which in my view means you should be getting more, not the, even the same as everybody else, but you're getting less. And so we have these families facing the, uh, the results of really what is government racism still in Canada in 2017. And uh, what's frustrating for me is that I have one of the few in the room, I think, that has ever done a child removal. Uh, I was a child protection worker in the downtown east side of Vancouver and on the North Shore. And I can tell you it's one of the most horrible things to have to do. And when you remove a child from their family, you at least want to promise them a better life. And the child welfare system, no matter how good that social worker is, is way overloaded with kids who could be home if they had the proper supports. And the result is that the kids in care are not getting the type of childhood and youth that they deserve to have. So the state becomes the neglectful parent. And I think that we should be doubling down on providing supports to families, especially families, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit families who have uh, this historical disadvantage and this inequitable service, but also true of other people with multi-generational trauma, refugees and others. Um, we have got to start really helping people with what they need instead of uh, the answer is we're going to take your child away. Uh, because we see there's way too many First Nations, Métis, Inuit kids, just like Jill, who are growing up and having to go back and search for their childhoods, and they can never truly find it. Um, one of the other things that's mentioned about his, um, his mother or that case was that she had a plan. She had a plan to give him to her, uh, her mother, yeah. his grandmother, to care for. Um, 
those plans come up a lot in terms of kin care, kinship care, in terms of the family taking over care of the child. This is, um, there's a grand tradition in indigenous cultures that that's what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in, from, for, from the Anishinaabe, you know, for example, the, the grandmother almost always cared for the children because the parents had to go, you know, supply, you know, have a life and, and gather and, you know, ha, you know, supply or b bring resources back to the community. Well, and also the grandparents are smarter, right? Yeah. Like they have a little <laughs> bit more life it. experience under their belts. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so the, it was just a different style of, yeah. of, uh, of childcare. In your experience, how, you know, why is that, is that, are those plans rejected so, so much? Like what, did, why, why can't we get more of that type of care happening? Well, one of, the, one of the things is we have an overloaded child welfare system, so people sometimes don't even ask that question at the front door, right? Uh, you don't have the ability for a parent, unless the family is very clear on their own family history, and in First Nations, Métis, and Inuit families, that's often been disrupted by residential schools and everything. You don't really know all the extended family, and you yourself as a parent are in a traumatized state just for having removed your child. So uh, there are some First Nations agencies, though, that actually have people who actually, that's their job, is to map out the connections of all children in the community, not just kids in care, um, so that if there ever is a crisis, that you, the child knows the various parts of their family and someone could be located very quickly. Um, the other piece that happened, though, and I think it's fair to say, is there was racism in the child welfare system. And there was also ageism. Uh, because it was a Western society belief that you had to be young to care for your kids. And so when a senior would present themselves, an elder, maybe in their 60s, and say, I would like to care for my grandchild, that was just ran against the grain. The idea would be in many of these files, that person is too old to look after that kid. But that's ridiculous. Like Even in mainstream society, Jesse, we know with the high price of housing and daycare, there's, there's grandparents all over the place who are looking after their grandkids, right? And doing a wonderful job about it. Yeah, my, my mom's looking after my kids right now. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, at least I hope. I hope, I hope that's happening. Mom, if you're watching, uh, check in. Um, Cindy, let's get to the, uh, move, step a little bit from the film. What, what is that? You've been fighting this for 10 years. Yeah. What, what is going on? Why, why, I mean, it is so frustrating. You know, this past week we saw the Senator Lynn Bayek with her comments Conrad Black wrote a rather horrible piece in the National Post yesterday. Where is the will to, to, to do this? Why, like the government's been fighting you for, for 10 years, it's gonna fight you again. Yeah, next week. Um, I don't know if any of you, if, if you all know about this case, and uh, we want, the children won the case last year, January 26th. Uh, the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found that the government of Canada is racially discriminating against 165,000 children in this country by depriving First Nations children an equal chance to grow up with their families and also not allowing them to access all the other government services on the same terms as other children. They were ordered, legal order, to immediately stop. They welcomed the decision, the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. I remember watching the news conference. I took a big sigh of relief because I'm not a lawyer. Like, I'm just, I, <laughs> I just want these little kids to get the childhood they deserve. It's that simple. And then they didn't do anything. There's been two non-compliance orders against the Canadian government for failing to act and end that racial discrimination. And we're going back uh, for other hearings this week. And uh, you all can watch on webcast at fnwitness.ca and see your government in action. And the thing that drives me nuts about this is I hear them talking about the money. You know, and a non-Aboriginal girl who understands that First Nations kids get lost, she said, you know what discrimination means? It's when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. So imagine if you weren't worth the money, or even that your child wasn't worth the money because of who they were, and you were being judged by Canadians who don't know any better as if they get more. And then when the government treats you a little bit less unequally, but through a budget announcement, it gives you a bit less inequality, but you're still not equal to other children, would you be grateful? That's what's happening in this country. And I went to the Minister of or the Finance Committee in Parliament, and I said, okay, if we're so broke in this country that the only way that we can stay afloat is by racially discriminating against little kids, then what are First Nations children losing to? A half a billion dollars for the birthday party coming up? 
The Renaults over there in Parliament, there's like cranes up there all the time. They're going to drape that thing for 15 years. What are they going to do, Jesse, for 15 years to that building? And all the time, these kids are losing childhood. There, it's clear to me that there's a lot of political symbolism and rhetoric, but where the political will really needs to come to end this racial discrimination is from folks just like you. You are those kids' best chance. Until politicians understand that caring Canadians are no longer going to tolerate racial discrimination as fiscal policy against little kids, it's going to continue to happen because they've so normalized it. It's in the government's DNA, and they make excuse after excuse, and as uh, the tribunal said, they were, they'd known about this discrimination for decades. They've known about the harms for kids for decades. They've ignored solutions to deal with it. So yeah, I'm baffled. I just can't, I'm still in shock we had to file the case and I'm in shock that they haven't even implemented. Well, and, and you're not alone. I mean, I believe the government still spends more fighting indigenous people in court yeah. than it does on delivering services to us. Yeah. Uh, and that is, that is not new. That is <laughs> like 25 years worth of, of that. It goes a, long, a way, way back. Uh, uh, for that. And the fiscal arg argument, Cindy, it drives me nuts because they're talking about they don't have the money. Yeah. And I look around and go, where does all that money come from? That's right. Where does all of this, yeah. all of this come from? Yeah. It comes from the theft of the land. Yeah. It comes from, and the children, taking the children, taking the culture, taking the language is all in service of stealing the land. It's all about divorcing us, disconnecting us, taking the kids away moving us from our territories, all of this was in function of that. And when they say they don't have the money, it's, it's all the, it's, the money is all from that. So I, 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 that is so frustrating. And I, I don't know how we ever reframe the debate in Canada for Canadians to understand that, that it, the indigenous people should actually be the wealthiest, the most, you know, and, and, and I see this in Toronto. You know, my kids were in First Nations school in downtown Toronto. And to me, this should have been the shining jewel of the TDSB, yeah. and it was not. This should have been the most, they, it should have been three computers to every kid. You know, my, my son should have had Max, PC, <laughs> the whole thing, whatever he wanted to, to play, and it wasn't like that at all, yeah. it, you know, even within the, the TDSB. So I don't quite under, you know, I find that a really frustrating fallback for them, that, that we can't shift the conversation to understand where the wealth of this country is actually originated from and that there's an obligation under the treaties where they promised that they would reciprocate, that there would be benefits or there would be reciprocal care, that, that we're still 10 years in, you're gonna have to go back to court, you're gonna have to fight this again next week. Yeah, and you know, like Canada negotiates trade agreements all the time, right? And uh, they adhere to those trade agreements because they, they know there's consequences for them. Um, I think it gets down to what Gord Downey so eloquently said in that concert, um, that Canadians have been trained their entire lives to look away. It's uh, not even look away, but to judge. You know, there's no compassion amongst many people who just don't know any better. I find that when people come to understand, they care about it and are appalled. But so many of us of our generation, like I don't know about you, but when I went to public school, and I just narrowly escaped residential schools because they were all around me. Um, but when I went to public school, I, re I still remember the Hudson Bay Company. That was basically the only time we talked about the Indians. And um, it was like, all you had to do is bring in these furs, and you got all this great stuff in return. And that was it. That was the whole coverage of the uh, of uh, First Nations. I remember reading about learning about Duncan Campbell Scott and Canadian literature, and um, you know I loved literature, but I didn't like Duncan Campbell Scott's poems even back then. But no one told us what he did in a day job, which was he ran the residential schools for fifty two years. Um, so there's been a I think a very purposeful training of Canadians to not see that. And that is an injustice to all Canadians. It really is an injustice because we see the best of that compassion come out when, for example, with the Syrian refugee crisis. I, I think that was wonderful. But we see what the training is, is to not, not respond in that same way to First Nations, Métis, or Inuit peoples. Which brings me around to, uh, you know, part of the reason why we're here, which, and part of the reason why, you know, you're part of this movie, Alanis Abomswin, the mother of oh, indigenous she's, cinema. Uh, 
like she's just a she's a major hero, right? So oh. this is this, and she is absolutely beautiful. Uh, I my goal in my life, I'm 52, and my goal is to look half as good as Ellen Isa Bomsawin at 84. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you I mean, too. Yeah, yes. Oh, absolutely. we gotta get together. We gotta I, get, get some kind of uh, brewing herbs or something, I, right? <laughs> I hope to one day own half of her shoe collection. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's it's incredible. I mean, holy smokes. Um, but I'm interested in just, you know, because this series was really conceived as a way to help people understand, yeah. to, to engage in these conversations. Alanis has been doing this now for across almost 50 films, almost 50 years, including this one she's, she's made about uh, you, we can't make the same mistake twice. So in that process of, of you being a subject of a film, you've traveled with the film now, you know, you're at TIFF yeah. with the film and you've spoken to tons of audiences. Can you speak just about you know, as an activist, now you have this f piece of art yeah. that travels and that people can discuss through. So can you talk about the power of using something like a movie to get your message across? And, and you know, we just saw Gil use it so incredibly effectively to get his message across. Because this movie was just devastating. It's devastating now, and it was absolutely devastating when it came out, because these were not, this was not an issue discussed. Oh, no. Uh, I mean, you were embarrassed if you had anything to do with welfare, right? Like, this was all under the carpet. This was not something that was talked about. And, it was taboo in Canada. And the adoption, there was an incredible amount of shame even around the kids being taken into care, yeah. so the families would, it, 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 these were just not topics yeah. discussed. So t can you talk a bit about the role of cinema in activating people in as an activist and what it means to be you know part of the film now and seeing a movie like this you know um i think when i tell people that canada is as a country racially discriminating against little kids people want to turn away it's, it's so painful like it can't be true um not the canada i go out and celebrate on canada day that can't be true you see the images of the prime minister and then you look at Trump. You think, well, he's, he's better than that, right? It has to be better than that. Um, the power of, of cinema is that it brings it to the, 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 the consciousness of the people. You, I, we don't tell you what to think. You get to see in Elenice's beautiful film, the government people testifying. You get to see some of the First Nations folks testifying. And the most important for me in that film is you get to see some of the families, like Gil, uh, who are affected by it. And you are the jury, really, in the, that film. You, as caring individuals, are given the information to make up your own decision. And that is, in fact, what we're trying to do with the webcast, but it is so much more beautifully done in cinema because people like Elenise, like yourself, and other filmmakers are able to tell the story like in ways that I wouldn't have told it. Like I, um, at TIFF, I, I, was, I flew in from Sydney, Australia. I was over there to see the Aboriginal people in Sydney, Australia. So I missed the first four, 40 minutes of the film. Uh, but I remember looking at it, and it was surreal. And I would say to myself, wow, I, I, I wonder if I was there that day. But then there's a picture of me. I saw it in real time. But it looks different when you are, even for me, I learn things. Just as you were saying about this film, you've seen it 20 times. I learn things every time I see it. And, the, and because even people like me are learning, and I hope audiences go to see that film more than once, because what you take from it, becomes part of your DNA. You start to be less able to look away and more able to really turn your minds to the children. They're the ones that really matter. I said in that tribunal, and I mean it, even sitting here today, I don't want the tribunal to make the best decision for the Caring Society or the Assembly of First Nations or for the Chiefs of Ontario or for the Nishnabi Aski Nation. And I certainly don't want it to make it for the government of Canada. But if they make the best decision for the kids, like they did the first time, then everybody in the country wins. Even Canada wins. It just doesn't know it yet. It's too hooked into its colonial DNA. But it will be happy, just as many other nations free of the chains of racism. Now look back at those days as dark days and at the, at the struggle as being one of the defining moments when the people came close to the potential of the, of the values that that nation uh, feels so proud of. That can happen here too. It, can't, it hasn't happened yet, but it can.
So I want to open it up to uh, to you folks again. If you can raise your hand, and we can get a microphone to you, so everyone on the uh, the webcast can hear you, and we'll get going. Yes, uh, sir, in the back there. We'll just get the microphone over to you. Hi. Is that a Toronto Maple Leaf sweater you got on there? Win Winnipeg Jets. Oh, Winnipeg Jets. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I, my name's Ben. Uh, I am uh, obviously as a non-Indigenous person from Winnipeg, a settler. Um, I um, am a teacher in the Toronto District School Board, mm -hmm. and uh, there's been a lot of effort. Uh, yeah, a lot of effort. Uh, <laughs> I think is the right word. Um, not necessarily results, but a lot of effort. Uh, in terms of trying to bring more truth into classrooms uh, and to students, and they're very much, um, as young people, open to those ideas. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to work on is also then thinking about uh, decolonizing, uh, as, as you were just talking about, the deep roots, roots of, of colonial ideas in all of our systems. Um, so I guess my question is then, uh, from both of you, what do you see as ways that I can think about uh, not just truth, but actually reconciliation in a classroom? Um, because the truth seems much more obvious, especially when you're hearing people's stories. But the reconciliation seems a lot more difficult. Well, on our website, fncaringsociety.com, we have seven free ways for anyone of any age to make a difference in under two minutes. Because we know there's lots of caring people, but they just don't know what to do to kind of act on those feelings of caring. And um, many of them are structured for children. Um, we didn't start it out that way. But the children, as you point out, children are not experts in politics or law or even history. But children are experts in love and fairness. They know it's not right for one other group of children to be getting less because of their race. They just know that's not fair. So they'll want to do something about it. And what's been so uplifting for me in this, this battle, I guess, against the government has been to see how these children have taken this on as their civil rights struggle. And they have embraced this, not in anger and not in sadness, but with a sense of love. They know that it takes love to defeat the racism and it takes light, the knowledge, like you're teaching them in the classroom, to defeat the racism. And one of the groups that's given those teachers and those students that, those tools, has been projectaheart.ca. And I'm not sure if you have Project to Heart in a Toronto School Board, but uh, you know, three cheers to these, gr these great teachers who founded that organization. And all of you, as older citizens, can also go and check out the Project to Heart. Because I think even though it's geared to elementary kids, that's the knowledge level that many of us had in school. So why not start there? And then I think these cinemas, uh, these films that you have at TIFF, and uh, just bringing in, uh, there's a documentary called Hi Ho, Mr. Hay. Uh, it is a documentary about one of my greatest heroes, Shannon Kustachin, who um, is from Attawapiskat First Nation, and she spent her entire childhood fighting for proper schools. So bringing in Hi Ho, Mr. Hay, and then talking about Shannon's dream, which is one of the seven free ways to make a difference, and uh, if you're really into a, a tearjerker, you can actually just Google Shannon Kustachin on YouTube and you'll hear her talking. And uh, I ask everybody to watch that video because that makes it so hard to turn away. It humanizes what the discrimination looks like when she speaks. She was a great teacher. Uh, yeah, children are the greatest teachers, I ah. think. Um, I would echo everything Cindy just said. I would also check out um, as another resource 4Rs, which is a youth-driven yeah. uh, organization, national organization, has also just released a guidebook around reconciliation. So I'd also urge you to to check that out. Um, we've just got we've got time for just a couple more uh, questions, three more. And we also have the Inuit Tepperosat Kitanami, who has got some great yeah. uh, resources on Inuit children. So it takes a little bit of effort, but but it, yeah. there's stuff out there absolutely to help uh, help guide that in the classroom. More questions? Yes, let's just get, yeah, get your mic. Yeah, it's not like the old, I remember, like I don't ever remember even a, a book, a children's book on indigenous people other than cowboys and Indians when I was growing up. Like John Wayne, that was pretty much it. And I always wanted to be a cowboy because you live longer in the game, right? The Indians were the first ones to die off, right? Yeah, that was all, it made play dates really 
challenging as a child, <laughs> I have to admit. It was very conflicted on which yeah. side. I, the only books I remember would, would have been um, uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, the D. Brown historical book, oh, yeah. which was not a book for children at all, or uh, Basil Johnson's Indian School Days uh, was, is the other one that would pop to mind. But no, you're right. And certainly nothing in a textbook. No. Nothing at all like that. No. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, here in the city, and perhaps other cities, there are now uh, indigenous agencies working uh, for uh, child services. Um, is, is that making a difference? Is it a different reality in the city than it is in, um, in, uh, you know, in First Nation communities? Um, you have Native Child and Family Services here with Ken Richard, uh, who is the director of that agency. He does remarkable things. I think one of the things that I like about that agency is it's very holistic. Um, but what Ken will tell you firsthand is a lot of the families he services are effectively refugees from other First Nations in, in Canada because of the underfunding of services, um, the families are actually pushed off reserve, right? You know, if that kind of assimilation is happening. So if you want to get your child a, a, some medical help, um, even from a larger reserve, you sometimes have to just step across that reserve line to come here and get help on equal terms as other kids. So um, he's had to become very good at trying to liaise back with these First Nations. And their agency is also desperately underfunded. I don't get it why governments have not figured out what the World Health Organization has been saying for decades, is that the best investment any government can make is in children. For every dollar a government spends on a child, you save $20 downstream. And um, so underfunding agencies like Native Child and Family Services in Toronto or the First Nations agencies or the Métis Service agencies here in Toronto makes zero sense because the reverse is also true. For every dollar of fool's gold government saved by underfunding children, you can expect to spend as a taxpayer $20 downstream. It's like Frederick Douglass uh, said years ago, I think that I'm going to try and quote, the, quote his eloquence properly, but it was uh, better to raise a healthy child than to fix a broken man. And I think that's still true today. Um, I should say too, we have preliminary evidence that despite being severely underfunded, First Nations uh, agencies are far better at placing kids with their families than non-Aboriginal agencies. And of course, to be pointed out and underscore, the indigenous people are the youngest population and the fastest growing population in Canada. So when you underfund the children, you're actually affecting an increasingly large portion yeah. of Canada's future. You know, the people that are going to need to help build this country further, you're actually underfunding them. And the one other thing I, I forgot to mention was they always mention, you know, the conditions on the reserves. Yeah. They never acknowledge why those conditions exactly. exist. Exactly. You know, uh, if, you know, if we under if you and I became co-mayor of Toronto <laughs> and uh, we decided, you know, we wanted to kind of replicate conditions of the reserves and we caught one in six Toronto uh, families out of water and we, um, we cut all your public services by 30 to 50 percent. Uh, some of you wouldn't have sewer. Um, I don't think we'd get elected again. And, um, you know, people would track it back. But what people do often, that training to not look away, is to blame the family, right? Is to say that you're not, you're, um, it's not only that you're not being uh, grateful for all the good stuff we're doing, you don't know how to keep your house clean, right? That kind of nonsense. That's part of that devastating training that Canadians have gotten. But thankfully, so many of them are starting to break through it. And I'm so grateful to those people with the courage to learn. So remind people, uh, before we go, where they can tune in on, on Wednesday uh, and, and what to look forward to or look, look to next week. Right. There are uh, multiple motions of finding Canada out of compliance with its order to stop racially discriminating against kids. Uh, some of you remember the very tragic deaths of two girls in Wakapika First Nation in January. Uh, that will be talked about in this trial because Canada was ordered to provide mental health treatment on par with what other kids get. They, refu they did not do that in January. And the physician and the acting coroner for that community said those deaths were preventable had that, those services been provided. So Canada's noncompliance is actually deadly for kids. 
Um, you can watch the hearings beginning at 9 a.m. Um, Eastern Time, and it's at fnwitness.ca. It'll be a free webcast. Uh, you can tune in uh, during your lunch hours, and certainly schools could watch it with your classes. The first day will be the Caring Society, as well as the Chiefs of Ontario and the Anishinaabeaski Nation. The next day will be the Assembly of First Nations and the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And then um, on, on Thursday afternoon, you get to see the Government of Canada. And the Government of Canada's official legal position right now is the tribunal has no authority to watch over us. You should just trust us. We're doing what we can. That's the position. Uh, in conclusion, I, w I want to, um, first I want to thank Gil Cardinal, who I'm sh I hope is watching. Uh, because I know he's watching. He, I'm sure he is. He's and out up there looking over all these kids right now. He'll be in that courtroom on Wednesday too. I, 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 I you're, you're right. I think, and I, uh, I hope he's glad of how we've presented the film here today. And then Cindy Chimigwich for all that you do. I, I cannot thank you enough. Our people cannot thank you enough. Chimigwich, Chimigwich. Well, it just takes one story like Gill, and all, everything is worth it, because people like Gill like Shannon Kustachin, and like every First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children across this country, they are worth the money. Thank you, folks. Go get them, Cindy.